Guys, I'll be reading uh, John first, chapter 5, 1 through 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God to obey his commands and his commands are not burdensome for everyone born of God overcome the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay. There is no feeling like the feeling of victory when your team has won when you share the victory of, of defeating something or someone else. You're on top of the world, even if it is just for a few moments. Feels great to come out the winner. Say, we're number one. Again, as a Cleveland sports fan, I have not had that feeling very often. The Indians have been this close a few times. It's been 30 years since the Browns even sniffed it, but, uh, but on June 19th, 2016, the Cleveland Cavaliers won the NBA championship after so many years. The Bible tells us that in Christ, we are victorious, that we've overcome the world. Now, the world is a mighty foe, but through Christ, we have beaten it. We are the champions of the world, as the old song says, although I don't think that old song was talking about the Christian life. But we as Christians should live our whole lives as victors. We've been made more than conquerors, the Bible tells us. Do each of you live each day as if you've just won a victory? Or is it more like you've maybe just come in a tie? <laughs> Many Christians live life as if they've just been defeated. There's none of that great aura of victory, of being overcomers and conquerors. More often than not, there's just that sinking feeling of failure and defeat. Well, why is that? Why do so few Christians experience victory in their lives? Well, I believe that it is because we tend to measure spiritual victory the same way that we measure other kinds of victory, and that is in terms of keeping score. In a contest or a game, the team or the individual that has the best score, the most points, or least points, sometimes, depending on the game, that is the victor. They've defeated the opposition. They have a better score. And so, to gain a spiritual victory, what do we do? We keep score. We look around us, and we see how we measure up to those who are around us. We see unbelievers out there and how they're living their life, and think, hey, I'm pretty good. I have victory. We compare ourselves to unbelievers, but not only do we that, do that, but we compare ourselves to one another. There is spiritual competition going on in the Christian community. That's just ridiculous. Many Christians feel that if they go to church and they say their prayers and they read their Bibles and they witness and they tithe more than their neighbor Christians, that they've won some sort of victory. Actually, when they haven't won anything at all. That, that's not spiritual victory. Or on the other end of things, if they see someone else who does those kind of things better than they do, or who has a deeper spiritual walk with the Lord than they do, then they feel like they're some kind of failure, and they've experienced some sort of defeat. When actually, that situation could be the key to great spiritual victory, to be able to actually learn from a more mature Christian. Sometimes the competition isn't so much with other Christians, but it's within ourselves. Now, coaches will often tell athletes, you know, don't worry about the other team or the individual, just try to beat your personal best and keep improving. And that's a great attitude to have with athletics. But I think for our spiritual lives, we need to make a distinction between success and victory. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm all for success. I'm all for improving your individual spiritual lives. I'm all for personal or group achievement. 
I'm all for setting goals and striving our hardest to reach those goals. You know, goals are important to, to gauge your success and to determine your progress and improvement. They help you to see if you're moving forward or just standing still or perhaps even moving backward. And that's why I like us as a church to set some goals and to reach for progress and success. And I think all of us as individuals should set goals for our lives and, and do our best to reach them, whether it's your professional goals or, or your personal devotional goals, to, to try to do better uh, in, in your spiritual life. But the thing is, you can be very successful and still not have spiritual victory. Spiritual victory comes when you place all of your trust in Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished for you. He has won a victory that we would not ever have any chance or hope of winning. Kind of like my rooting for the Cavs and when we had LeBron and Kyrie and all those good players that made us so good that we don't have anymore. But when they beat the Warriors, that one time out of four times that they made the finals, they beat them once and they won the championship. And I'm pretty sure I looked at Luke and I said, we did it. <laughs> We didn't do anything. <laughs> but, but because I had chosen to align myself with that particular team, I could feel that I was sharing in the victory. If you choose to align yourself with Jesus Christ, then you can share in the victory that only he could ever accomplish. He has conquered sin and death, and he has offered us the opportunity to share in that victory. Spiritual victory comes for us then. When we focus not on what we do, what we have accomplished as a church or as individuals, but when we focus on what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. He has won a victory that we can only experience when we place our lives in his hands. Jesus is the reason for our victory, and he is the example of living a victorious life. As this passage in 1 John 5 that Bo read for us so eloquently tells us, all we have to do is believe in Jesus' victory, and we get to share in it. Verse 4 says, everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. I would like this morning to take a look at some of the ways that the Bible tells us that we can live a victorious life, all of which follow the example of Christ and his life on earth. And to help you remember these concepts, I thought of words that begin with the letters of the word victory. For instance, the first thing we need to do is to be vigilant. Jesus told his disciples to watch and pray, to be on the alert for Satan's tricks. Christ, when he lived on earth, had an acute awareness of how the devil works and that that is the key to having victory over him. Now, psychologists will tell you that if you believe that someone hates you and is out to get you, that you're paranoid and you are unhealthy mentally. Well, I stand before you today to tell you that if you are a Christian, that Satan hates you and he's out to get you. And you better be aware of that and watch out for it. And if that makes us paranoid, then that's a legitimate paranoia because it's the truth. Many times when a Christian falls to temptation, it's not so much out of a, a flagrant disobedience or, or out of some great desire to commit a particular sin but rather it's just because he or she was not alert to Satan's tactics and fell into something without really thinking about it. But we are just as accountable for those kinds of sins as any other sins. The first step to having spiritual victory is to know who your opposition is and how he works. Your opposition is not other people, it's not even yourself, but it's Satan, the prince of sin and death, Satan and his many demons. That is who Jesus conquered when he died and rose again. And that is who we can conquer through Jesus if we are vigilant. 1 Peter 5.8 says, be self-controlled and alert. King James says, be sober and vigilant, uses that word. Because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. So we need to be vigilant or we will be devoured. We also need to be involved. Among the most defeated people that I have known are those who live their lives on the outskirts, never really bothering to get involved in anything, especially the life of the church. When you're just not involved in anything, then it's easy to convince yourself that you're being excluded and therefore begin to feel jealous and, and bitter and critical. And that sure doesn't make for a very victorious life. 
Jesus was constantly involved in the lives of others, doing his Father's work, helping the needy, healing the sick, saving the lost. We need to follow that example and be involved in the Lord's work. And that way you will be much less likely to be the one sitting back and just watching and criticizing about how they don't do this or that down at the church. If you're involved in the middle of a project or a particular ministry, then you're going to be too busy working to be the ones who are on the outskirts watching and complaining and criticizing. And yes, I know it does take a risk to be involved because then you might be the one who is criticized. You are the one who is vulnerable. But as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, 1, we are workers together with Christ. And unless you become involved in his work, then you're not going to experience his victory in your life. And your life will just be in vain. If you happen to be one of those people that are on the outskirts of the Lord's work, maybe it's perhaps you're just relatively new in church, or maybe you just haven't found your niche yet, please know that there is a place of service and involvement here for you at our church. And we invite you to get involved. If you haven't been asked, I apologize for that. We, we've missed the boat if that's the case. But, but don't punish us for that. Don't, don't punish God for that. All you would really be doing is punishing yourself. Get involved and share in the victorious life of our Lord Jesus Christ. Something else we can do to make sure that we're living a victorious life is to be courageous. Now, it doesn't take all that much courage to be a Christian in our society, not when you compare it to some other places around the world where a commitment to Christ means that you may forfeit your very freedom or your income or your family. Now, we aren't often forced to stand up and be counted for the Lord. But every once in a while, we do have an opportunity to show courage for our convictions. And so often, we just fail. I remember once being on a flight and I was seated in front of a young man who was obviously very drunk and it was about as rude and obnoxious a person as could be. And for the entire flight, all of us around him were exposed to his loud and crude and profane behavior. And in the midst of his conversation with a poor person next to him, which we all heard whether we wanted to or not, he announced that he was a middle linebacker for, the national, for a National League football team. And he looked it. I think he informed us in the process of his height and weight, which was 6'2 and 250 pounds. And at one point, he used the Lord's name in a way that I found very offensive. You know, not just offhand profanity, but an outright blasphemous statement. And what I wanted to do so much was just to stand up and turn around and ask him not to use my Lord's name that way. Not only for his sake, he was probably too drunk to get it, but just for the, the sake of all of, of the people around us. And that's what I wanted to do. But what I chose to do was to sit in my seat and stare straight ahead. I guess I figured we were pretty far from the nearest hospital, but... Actually, it was unlikely that anything bad would have happened to me. If I would have just had the courage to say something for my Lord, it wouldn't have taken that much courage. But I didn't, and I did not feel very victorious about my Christian life that day. And I hope I've done better in the days since then. Well, Jesus showed us the victory of courage time and time again. He stood right up to anybody and took insult and abuse and mockery and, of course, violence because he had the victory all along. And I strongly believe that there is coming a day when it will take real courage in our country to be a Christian. And we just might have to stand up and take our lumps for the Lord. But if we would, we would have greater victory than we ever could have experienced otherwise. So let's just start now and learn to be strong and of good courage. As the Lord told Joshua in Joshua 1.7, which says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. So let's look for opportunities to stand up for our convictions and to bravely face whatever consequences there might, not, not, there might be for not turning to the right or to the left and following the law of the Lord. Let's have that victory in our lives. Something else that we can do, though, is to be thankful. All of us have blessings in our life for which we are truly thankful. I know that. But all of us also have things going on in our lives for which it is very hard to be thankful. Victory in your life can be determined by which of these you choose to dwell upon. If all you think about are the rough times you're going through, 
then you're going to experience defeat. But if you can still be grateful for the blessings that God has given you, then you can know the victory of thankfulness. In fact, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says that in everything we are to give thanks, in all circumstances. That's a very important concept to get a hold of. Be thankful for your blessings, but also for your trials. If you're thankful instead of bitter, then victory and defeat in your life are not defined according to the circumstances going on in your life, but rather by your response to those circumstances. It depends on your level of, of faith and your thankfulness to Christ. As the great old hymn says, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. If you're thankful, you will have victory no matter what might be coming your way. Next thing I might say is to be optimistic. And I kind of hesitated to use that word or not because of the prominence of such philosophies in our society as you know, possibility thinking or, or the, the power of positive thinking which say, well, I can do anything if I think I can do it. So I'm not up here to just give you a pep talk and talk about the little engine that could. You know, if you say, I think I can, I think I can, then you can do it. That's not my point at all. The Bible says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's a big difference there. It's about where your optimism lies. It's important to be optimistic in life, to look at the positive side of things. If you're always pessimistic, looking for and looking at the negative all the time, then it is literally impossible to have any victory. But sometimes that's hard. Even when you read the Bible and you hear the message of judgment and, and the desperation and, and the doom of the world, you know, there's a lot to be pessimistic about. But knowing Jesus makes all the difference. We need to be optimistic, but not in ourselves, not in our own abilities, not in our power, but to be optimistic about our hope of glory, which is Christ in us. He has turned the dark into light and the night into day. And because of that victory, we can be optimistic and we can share the victory that he's already won for us on the cross of Calvary. Another thing that might bring more victory in your life than you might ever imagine is that if you would be reliable. One of God's many attributes is that he is absolutely and completely reliable. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Whatever God says, you can count on. There's never any need for any doubt about whatever God has said. And this is the quality that he wants to produce in us in order for us to have a life of victory. We need to believe in the reliability of God and to follow the example of Jesus in this area as well. Now, some people are able to do great and marvelous things, but to be honest, you never really know for sure if they're going to follow through with everything or not. Any day, give me someone who may not be all that talented or capable, but if they say they're going to do something, you know they're going to do it. You can depend on them to do it. There's more victory in being reliable and trustworthy than in achieving the greatest of accomplishments. And so instead of necessarily just shooting for the moon with all of our goals and objectives, perhaps we should just mainly shoot to be reliable, to be constant, to be faithful. And God will do those great things through us, even if it is just in our completing the tasks that we committed ourselves to do. You know, the meetings that we said that we would go to, the phone calls that we said that we would make. There is victory in reliability. And then one more, the why of the word victory is to be yielded. Now this is contrary to what we would think would be necessary for victorious living. We would think that the victor is the one who is in control of his own destiny, who is his own boss and, and knows his own mind. But the truth is that we can never be truly victorious spiritually until we yield ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ each and every day. Jesus had victory because he yielded to the will of his Father, even when he didn't really want to. He said in Luke 22:42, not my will, but thine. And it could be that the root of most of our sin is because we cannot honestly say that. We say, I'm doing my will right now, not thine. But we can only have victory in life when we yield control, when we hand over the reins of our life to God and let him take over. It's Jesus who's gained the victory, and we share his victory when we simply trust him. 
May you know the victory by following these examples of Jesus and having that experience of being on top of the world. And by that, I mean by being overcomers of the world, not, not a feeling that you have that everything's great in your life and your team just won. If you feel defeated, if you're beaten up by life, please look at these areas in your life and see if perhaps you're not being vigilant. You're not aware of the strategies of our enemy. Are you involved in life and, and in the work of the Lord? Or are you just waiting around for everybody and everything to come to you? Are you courageous when those opportunities come up to stand up and be counted for the Lord? Are you thankful for what God has given you even when you don't always feel that you have that much? Are you optimistic, able to see the positive ways that God is working in your life even though there are negative things? Are you reliable in the responsibilities that God has given to you? And are you yielded to God's will for you? If you can't say yes to these questions, then of course you're going to feel defeated because you're trying to win when all you can expect really is to lose. In closing, I'd like to read something that I found when I was a sophomore in high school, many, many years ago, but I've kept ever since. I had to make a copy of it because my original copy was all torn and, and tattered, but it's entitled Victory. When you are forgotten or neglected or purposely set at naught and you smile inwardly, glorying in the insult or the oversight, that is victory. When your good is evil spoken of, when your wishes are crossed, your tastes offended, your advice disregarded, your opinions ridiculed, and you take it all in patient loving silence, that is victory. When you are content with any food, any raiment, any climate, any society, any solitude and interruption, that is victory. When you bear with any discord and annoyance, any irreg irregularity, unpunctuality of which you are not the cause, that is victory. When you can stand face to face with folly, extravagance, spiritual insensibility, contradiction of sinners, persecution, and endure it all as Jesus endured it, that is victory. When you never care to refer to yourself in conversation, nor to record your good works, nor to seek after commendation, when you can truly love to be unknown, that is victory. As the Apostle Paul said, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ.